Let us welcome back to the podium the Honorable Rohan Senanan, Minister of Works and Transport. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Senator Foster Cummins. It's only in the PNM, people from other political parties that want to come and join us. So, I mean, they really said in La Hoqueta is the place to be tonight, you know. <laughs> Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and undoubtedly the leader of the People's National Movement, Cabinet colleagues, uh, Camille Robinson Regis, and Chairman of the party, Mr. Franklin Kahn, Senator Foster Cummins, and Councillor Gibson from Carapo, other cabinet colleagues, other members of the PNM executive, and I have to single out the executive from the La Hoqueta Talparo constituency. I, I, I want to also so help, say hello to your member of parliament, Mr. Maxi Coffey, and I, I will be very surprised if he's not listening to us tonight. I have been working in this constituency for the last couple of months, uh, ensuring that you got the representation that you deserve. And I must report to the leadership of the People's National Movement that this constituent executive has stood out and have really accepted the challenge in the absence of their MP and have worked with me and the rest of my ministerial colleagues to ensure that the service continue. And I think for that, this entire hall needs to give the executive a round of applause. I also want to use the opportunity to thank all the cabinet colleagues, all the ministers who would have put their effort into La Hoqueta. I want to single out uh, Minister Daryl Smith, Minister of Sports, who whenever I can't come to the constituency, will come to the constituency. And he was here, I think, on Tuesday when we were in the Senate and would listen to the complaints of the Burgesses. So Daryl and all the rest of the, the ministers, senators who have been assisting this constituency, on behalf of the constituency and the MP, I thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, my task is simple tonight. It's just to basically inform the citizenry of the part that the Ministry of Works and Transport is doing to ensure that the infrastructure and the economy, the infrastructure is maintained, improved, and the economy start back at that level where we expect growth in the shortest possible time. We all know about the financial challenges that the country is going through. We all know about it. We feel the pains that some of our colleagues will go through. We have inherited a country where, because of mismanagement, we have been paying the price for, I would some people may say mistakes, errors, I would say rampant corruption that happened between 2010 and 2015. The world economy is a cycle. But if you manage in the time of boom properly, when the time of bus come, you can still cushion that to an effect where you, it doesn't affect your standard of living. Unfortunately, between 2010 and 2015, that was not done in this country. There was a downturn in, in revenue. But rather than the government of the day managing the revenue, they continue rampant spending. And even when the revenues were up, the spending went up with it. So that, that, that ban between the revenue and expenditure just continued to grow. When we came into government in 2015, we were faced with that big challenge where we had oil price going all the way down in the 20s. And of course, you can't just change the economy overnight and the expectations from the population. So this government was faced with the challenge of first stabilizing the economy. 
I think I would like to compliment the Minister of Finance, led by the Honorable Dr. Keith Rowley, for actually stabilizing this economy and this country. We have passed that stage of stabilization, and now we're in the path of growth. And as, as we see at, at, at the backdrop, we are now going forward with this country. And I want to thank the citizens for understanding the time that we were in. Because there, were, there are many countries, if they had gone through what we went through, they would have had serious unrest. This government was able to maintain the labor force to ensure that although there was no big growth, nobody was sent home. The government does have a plan, despite what the naysayers may say. And now is the time for us to see that turnaround in this country. I will report simply on some of the projects that the Ministry of Works and Transport would have been doing. We have several divisions, and I can't report on everything tonight because we have been doing quite a lot of work with the limited funding that we have. So we have our bridges program where we have uh, 20, 17 bridges completed within 2016, 15 to 17. We have a, a, another 12 ongoing, and we have just got the approval for the cap, from the cabinet for additional 24 to be in the design stage. Under the PURE program, which is one of the programs that I want to touch, because this is a program that touches close to everyone, because we deal with the, this program, we deal with a lot of the minor roads. And I want Mr. former Minister Devan Maraj to listen to me, because he loves to write. And he liked to write the Integrity Commission. And recently, I was reading, before I came here, a letter he wrote to the Ministry of Works under the Freedom of Information. Under the PURE project, between 2010 and 2015, they spent close to $4.6 billion. Now, you compare that with the budget that I am working with in 20. 17, 2018 of just about $140 million. And we are still able to have work done throughout Trinidad and Tobago in all the constituencies. Just last week, I had to read in the parliament on a question um, in one constituency in Deep South, Tabakit, they spent $230 million over that period in one constituency. In the three Dago Martin constituency, meaning the, the constituency of the Prime Minister, the constituency of Minister Imbert and Daryl Smith, for that same period, they spent 60 million. The one constituency, they spent 230 million. And the entire Dago Martin, they would have spent 60 million. However, I got a letter from Freedom of Information questioning our, how we operate in pure. I just want to advise Mr. Devan Maraj. We operated the same day we did it with improvements. And the improvements that we started is that we started to tender projects in pure. And all indications are that the projects that we are tendering now, because there was a time when projects were basically handed out in pure. There was a lot of projects, a lot of money, and you could have, you, the system they use is we had a, a valued price, and then you hand the contracts out. Recently, we tendered out, we asked uh, NIPDEC to invite all the road paving contractors and let us tender the projects. Every, almost every single project came in below the engineer's estimate. And that is how we, we, we operate it now. This country has been very fortunate today. After the 2015 election, there was this talk in Trinidad and Tobago about corruption. 2010 to 2015 was a nightmare for corruption. And I thought that it will take us about 15 years to take away that stigma from Trinidad and Tobago. I am happy that today, in Trinidad and Tobago, the Transparency International Index shows that this government have turned that image around. I, I feel proud to serve in a government that after two years 
we can change the image of this country around and send the message that this government will not tolerate corruption. And I'll tell you how we do it. I just want to focus. We have several projects going on, and I don't want to go into all tonight. Some of the projects that I'm really happy about, uh, one of the projects, a simple project, is a simple project like the walkover at the taxi, water taxi in Port of Spain. Just a, a couple months ago, on the instructions of the Prime Minister, we engaged one, the, one of the units at the ministry, and I was quite pleased that in-house, working with some of the engineers, we could have done a design that we are going to have a walkover right by the, the water taxi terminal. So you will not see people coming off the boat, tourists and so running up and down. And these are some of the, the projects that we're looking at, projects that could touch the citizens directly. But more than that, we have some of our big projects. And tonight, I want to focus on four major projects and show you how and why the Transparency International Index gave Trinidad today a thumbs up. The Solomon Holchoy Highway. That highway, many of you may not know, was tendered out under the People's National Movement in 2010, 20, 2009, 2010. Unfortunately, by the time the evaluations were finished, an election was called and the PNM was out of office. The tenders that came in for that project came in $1.2 billion over the engineer's estimate. And that was one of the reasons why the contract was not awarded by the PNM. There was a change in government and the project, the contract was awarded for $1.2 billion over the engineer's estimate. And I will show you how we deal with a situation like that when we come to the Kumoto to Sandy Grandi, the Wallerfield to Sandy Grandi Highway. The project went on, and a lot of money was paid on the project. By the time we came in, in 2015, as we are aware, the project was halted, the contractor declared bankruptcy in some country. When we went into the figures, we realized we paid a lot more money than work was done. I can tell you in one area, in just the designs, some s almost $700,000 was paid. So, sorry, $700 million was paid for design that, based on the amount paid, should have been about 89%. What we found is that you paid 89% of the money, but you got just about 50% of the work. And what they were doing is just finding ways to pay money on the project. That project was awarded without even having the land acquisition sorted out. So the contractor just had a, a money tree to just be saying, okay, and as we go on, you just pay me. We're still tallying the figures as to the final cost of that, that highway. What we did is that when we took over the project, again on the instructions of the Prime Minister, we had to engage local contractors. And what we did is we broke the packages up where we will have close 12 packages to complete a certain segment of the highway. What that allowed, it allowed the local contractors to now come and compete and finish the highway. The local contractors accepted the challenge and almost every single package that we put out so far was won by a local below the engineer's estimate again. And it's because of things like that, you have Transparency International giving this government a thumbs up. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges we face with that highway is the land acquisition. I told you the PNM had tendered that project out. We had a, a, the engineer's estimate. The land acquisition on that project was $400 million under the PNM. So far, the previous government, because we did not get into any land acquisition so far uh, going, 
when we came into power. The cost of the land so far has gone to five, close to $500 million. My information as of today, they have only acquired 44% of the land. So it meant that the land price almost went up three times during that five-year period. And that is why the corruption index in Trinidad rose like that. And I thought it would have been difficult for us to change it. But I'm happy that the international world is seeing a big difference in Trinidad now with corruption. What we intend to do is to take on all these claims that we have and ensure that the citizens are not taken advantage of. I'll just give you one example. There's one piece of land that was valued for $5 million. The claim for the land ended up being $45 million. And this was just a piece of swamp land. Eh? So a piece of mangrove that somebody was storing some wood on. They were able to get that land to move from $5 million to $45 million. And in some cases, land that should not have been valued more than five, six million dollars, they have agreed to pay people 94 million dollars. And 95 million. That is what we're dealing with in some of these cases. Another project I want to talk about is the QREP interchange. That project cost a minister and an MP a seat in the 2015 election. The reason for that, there was an estimated budget of close to $600 million in 2013 or 2014. There was some big argument as to who should get a contract and who shouldn't get it, who was, as we say in Trinidad, who was batting for who. Eventually, the project was halted. We all know that, I think, in 2014. I might be mixed up with it, it might be 2015, because there was an argument which contractor should get it under the previous government. But the estimated budget could have been close to 600 million. We tendered out the project without any ministerial interference. We allowed NITCO to go through the process. I am happy that our estimate now we have awarded the contract for $212 million, $221 million, and the total estimate budget has gone down to about $321 million. Now, I say these things because as Minister of Works and Transport, most of the construction and the bigger projects fall in that ministry. And there's always talk about corruption. There's always talk. Tonight, I, this week, I heard Senator Wayne Mark in the parliament talking about a contract in Kumoto to Manzalena and how the PNM party get $50 million for the election. Tonight, I want to ask Senator Mark, that $250 million in that project alone, who was getting that kickback? I want Senator Mark to ask me that. But I also want to compliment Senator Mark because he was quite clear to understand you can't accuse any PNM minister because all the ministers sitting here and every minister here could account for the money and the car they drive in. So he couldn't point up ministers, but he jumped on the PNM looking for campaign financing. So they take money from that. I want to tell Senator Mark, PNM is not looking for campaign financing. That will look for us when the election time comes. <laughs> So, Senate, so, Senator Mark, when you're speaking for your party on how you all perform, speak only for your party. The PNM don't operate like how your party operates. This party has nothing but kickback and kickback. Anybody attempt in this party to go for a kickback, that leader is going to kick them out. So, so you could rest assured about that. I want to talk about the Komoto Wallafield to Sandy Grandi Highway a bit. That highway, the, the route alignment for that highway was done sometime in 2006. 
But bef let, before I go into the highway, I just want to, to respect the fact that that highway is before the court, and I'm not here to speak anything about the, the location of the highway or any part that we may be taking that is before the court. What I just wanted to draw is reference to the benefits of a highway like that without uh, subjudicating the case in any way. That highway was determined as a necessity years ago. This government decided to continue that highway. A highway is a continuous thing. They were, uh, under the, the previous PNM regime, you must have heard about the plans to have a highway all the way to Manzalena, a upgrade road from Manzalena, a highway from Mayaro to Princess Tong, a highway from Princess Tong to San Fernando. Everything can be done at one time. This uh, Churchill Roosevelt Highway started in Port of Spain. And it keep coming up. I remember just a few years ago, when you pass right uh, on the Omira, the, when you come out of the Omira, there were no two lanes highway there. Remember there was a mountain of, of, of dirt that remained there, material for years. A highway, at this, at this point in time, is Sandy Grandi time. Who have objections against that? What we're doing now is extending the highway to Sandy Grandi and then to have a connect the, uh, upgrade the road to Toko, where we'll come to that project in a while, a port, and also to extend to Manzalena. And from Manzalena, we take up to Mayaro, back to Princess Tong, back to San Fernando. It's just a connector and a continuation of a road. When I came into office, I saw a contract to be awarded for $1.8 billion for that road. Again, on the instructions of the Prime Minister, we are supposed to engage local contractors and we are supposed to tailor the packages as far as we could to ensure that local people get the job. We halted that process. We decided to go out, break the, break the contract up into packages. We got 13 packages. So rather than one person walking away, and that contract would have been much more than 1.8 billion. Rather than one person walking away with a contract for over two, two and a half billion dollars, we decided to cut it in 13 packages. The person who won the bid, who had the, the, the 1.8 contract before, tendered as well. It turned out that that price was 200 million more just for that package. So what it said is that if we cut it up for local contractors, local contractors could compete like anybody else. The difference in the price from the first and the second was 110 million. That means that you saved $110 million on that, just that one package. But if we had gone to the 1.8 contractor who was originally supposed to get the job, when he tendered for the same piece, his price was $200 million more. So you could imagine how much more you'd have been paying for that highway. And again, that is why Transparency International, looking at what is happening in Trinidad, and speaking to some of the people who in the know could say, this government is on the right track. <laughs> now, I have heard, again, Senator Mark and one of the guys who we just had to ask to leave, saying we're building a highway to nowhere. Well, I am proud to be from Sandy Grandi. And Sandy Grandi is somewhere. I don't know if many of you knows the northeastern part of Trinidad. Mayaro Regional Corporation and the Sandy Grande Regional Corporation makes up a little less than half of Trinidad and Tobago. It has the lowest income per household. More than 80% of the people don't pay tax because they work for less than $5,000 a month. It has the, the lowest level of, of education. 
And in terms of commerce, business and trade, we're talking about a little less than half the land mass, but it has 5% of the business in Trinidad and Tobago. People don't understand that. I know that because I am from that area. And people can't speak to that. But then I'm hearing people protesting and saying, why build a highway to nowhere? That is almost half of Trinidad. The figures will show you that Sandy Grande Regional Corporation, because we map it out in terms of the corporations, and Mayaro, both of them have the lowest amount of businesses in the area. And there's a simple reason for that. It's just a lack of infrastructure. People can't get in, people can't get out. Why will people want to go and live? Why will people want to do commerce in an area like that? But you know what? It's a part of Trinidad that has to develop now because it have food, it have tourism, you could get land cheap, nice land for housing, and what people don't know, the closest point to Tobago is Toko. And if we're talking about diversifying the economy, we must look in terms of tourism. So with a highway, think about the commerce that you'll develop. Think about the infrastructure. Think about the amount of businesses on the route. And put this into the contents that construct, road construction and infrastructure construction is almost 100% local. Sand, gravel, pushing down, no set of foreign exchange, because we have all the equipment right here. We have labor, putting people to work. Think about the benefits to that. And you take this highway, develop the infrastructure, then we head to Toku. What is there in Toku? This government has plans to construct an all-purpose port in Toku. What that means? In an all-purpose port, we're talking about one, a fishing port, an upgraded fishing port with the finest of facilities for the fishermen. We're talking about a marina. Because Sandy Grande people know, East Coast people know about a small boat too, not only in Darhav Yacht. So somebody have a little boat, they want to go to Tobago, they have a place to park it on the North Coast. We're talking about a ferry port to Tobago. We're talking about restaurants. Businesses, guest houses, a small hotel, and most important for that course, a Coast Guard station. One of the biggest problems on the North Coast is that it is just vulnerable to illicit drugs and ammunition. If the Coast Guard have to come to that area, they have to come all the way around. By the time they get there, those boats get in and get out and they're gone. What that will do for the people of Wallafield, Arima, the amount of jobs will be created, we calculate something like 3,600 jobs. And these are not jobs that will pay a minimum wage or below minimum wage. Think about boat repairs, tourism industry. This will allow a whole new industry in Trinidad. You can go to Toku. And in 45 minutes, you could be in Tobago. I just told the parliament when we had the shutdown of the sea bridge that it was cheaper for us to fly everybody to Tobago based on the amount we had because of the cost of operating the vessels in terms of diesel. It is one third the time from Toko to Tobago. You could have ferries running up and down. So you could leave here and decide you're going and drive up Toko, but the new road, it will take you about, from here probably about 40 minutes and 45 minutes to Tobago. Have lunch and come back down. <laughs> it's a reality because you don't have to go to Port of Spain and wait four hours on the ferry and you ain't sure if you're getting the ferry because you know what's what going on there. 
The idea is to bring Tobago and Trinidad closer. Tourists from Tobago could come down to Toko, spend the day, and go back to Tobago without having to go through the hassle. If we have to develop the tourist industry, we have to start to think like that. And that port in Toko is the answer for diversification. I want to ask the people from the East-West Corridor and throughout Trinidad to support that initiative because it is time that the entire Trinidad and Tobago is lifted. For too long, we have neglected this part and this part of the island has the answer for us going forward. So I want you all to support that initiative and I can give you the assurance that those projects will be completed. We do have our challenges on the highway and we wait for the outcome of the court action. And as a responsible government, we will abide by the final ruling on the matter. And I leave that there for now. I can go on and on with projects, but I don't want to confuse you too much with the projects because I really wanted to sell to this country tonight the importance of that road because there are too much negatives because some people just are bent on saying that a highway to nowhere, Sandy Grande is nowhere. My arrow is nowhere. Toko is nowhere. That is not truth. We are building a highway to somewhere that people lives. I just want to touch on the the port authority for a little while. We do have our challenges at the port. We recognize that the day we, we came into office. And there are some harsh decisions that has to be taken on the port because the port cannot continue as it's going. But it is not a fix that could happen overnight. We have taken some harsh decisions and as we go on, you will see the benefits of that. I just want to inform the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago that we are happy with the progress we are making. I know it is still a challenging time, but the plans going forward in terms of the sea bridge is clear. The government have taken the decision to put three vessels on the route. So we have one vessel operating now, which is the TNT Express. We expect the spirit to come off dry dock shortly. That will come into the operations. The express will go into dry dock, and we expect the express to come back out of dry dock probably by the end of August. However, by the end of April, we expect the new vessel, the Galleon Passage, to be here. So what we will have operating is two vessels, and by the time the express comes back out, we will have three vessels. That doesn't solve our problem, because our problem didn't start by not having vessels. It started because we had a very bad operation at the port. We did not have a proper maintenance plan, which the port is putting in place now. So with three vessels, we can maintain the vessels better. And when you take one off, you could still have two vessels. So the port board have been mandated to have a proper maintenance plan. Uh, and also, more important, a proper replacement plan for vessels. We bought two vessels 10 years ago, or however long. Unfortunately, vessels have a lifespan. And the new plan is, once these vessels come back out, we must have a replacement where you could replace vessels at intervals. So you will always have new vessels operating on the, 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 the sea bridge. And once the port in Toko comes in, what we expect happening is that a lot more passengers will go to Toko because it will be a lot more convenient. And that sea bridge problem will be a problem solved once and for all. I give you that commitment. Just bear with us a little more. I also want to touch on the airport, the airport terminal in Tobago. Cabinet have already uh, started the process for the new terminal building in Tobago. And very soon, we expect the sod turning in Tobago for a new terminal building sometime later on 
this year. So on behalf of the staff and my technical team at the Ministry of Works, I just want to give you all the commitment that the Ministry of Works is working in the interest of all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And in, at the Ministry of Works and Transport, we are doing things differently now. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your listening and to just tell you that great is the PNM and we will prevail. <laughs>